Good afternoon, everyone. For everybody online, we're just getting all set up here in the room, um, working on sharing the agenda on the screen so that everybody has visibility to that. Give us just one moment. All right, can I get confirmation from somebody online that they can indeed see the agenda that is being shared? Yeah, this is Mike up in Reading. I see it. Perfect, thank you. All right, let's go ahead and get started with uh, roll call. Uh, we'll start down on the left side of the room here. Brenda Bruner, present, representing Africa. Jody Pat, present, representing California Police Chief Association. Alicia Fuller, present, representing the California Highway Patrol. Jeff Logan, representing California Fire Chiefs Association. Casey Young, present, representing Calnina. And anybody online from the board? Or from the LRPC, sorry. Erin Riley, representing Cal State Sheriff's Association. Thanks, Erin. All right, we'll go ahead and proceed to the next item, which is the approval of the previous minutes. But does anybody have any questions regarding those minutes? Hearing nothing, we'll, uh, motion to approve. Can I get a motion, please? Brenda Bruner, motion to approve. I can second it, Joey Pat. Excellent. Uh, minutes approved as they stand. All right, moving right along to California 911 branch strategic updates. I'll turn it over to Ryan and Andrew to bring us to our first topic. All right, so uh, Ryan and I were talking about some of the uh, initiatives we're working on right now, so we'll get into a few of those, the ones that don't already have a um, an agenda topic assigned. <clears throat> so right now uh, we have started uh, in, in earnest on our pre-migration testing program. So we went through, as you all know, we did the Tiger Team testing uh, back in uh, June to October of last year. Uh, we were successful in getting call handling uh, pretty well set up uh, in order to um, uh, start the migration process. Uh, but what we needed to do is we needed to finish uh, autosis portion of failover testing. We had to do transfer testing, a couple other things. We're calling it pre-migration testing. That's an autos term. This is sort of their testing that we're running through. Um, so we've started that process. We got the, um, you know, the testing uh, protocols and workbooks ready to go. We got a schedule put together, quarter one schedule. Uh, we haven't gone out past that just yet. We're getting quarter two put together right now. Uh, and we got everything uh, lined up and we began that process last week. Uh, so what we're doing is we are testing at right now, um, two PSAPs per day, four days a week, for the just for the first two weeks. So last week and this week, doing a little, uh, kind of like we did with Tiger Team, uh, where, we, where we came in um, and, and did some I wouldn't call it testing, but but just lighter lighter loads, so we can see how everything looks, see how the the, the testing performs. Um, we'll finish that up this week, and starting next week, we're going to be uh, testing at four PSAPs per day, so one per region per day. So not, uh, you know, an intense schedule like the Tiger Team was, where we were doing upwards of ten or eleven per day. Uh, we're only doing four per day, so that'll be Monday through Thursday. And uh, right now we're just uh, getting a feel for how the, you know, how the testing is going to go. Uh, it's been uh, pretty going pretty well so far. Uh, we are running into some standard issues that we knew we would see in the field. Um, you know, CPE stuff. Uh, I think we've had a few um, transfer issues, uh, but we're we're working through it. Uh, nothing, nothing unusual at this point. Um, we have hired and awarded contract to a project management firm, an IT project management firm to come and help us. So this project, while we have the staff to generally to conduct it and carry it out, especially with the help of the next gen vendors, uh, this is going to take us through the entire year. So four PSAPs per day, four days a week sounds like a lot. Uh, but when you extrapolate that out to the whole state, it's 
10 months worth of work. So, um, you know, my team, my next gen project managers have other assignments, other things that they have to worry about. So we brought on some extra extra bodies to help us with this process um, to do a lot of the scheduling, the outreach, the um, you know, really the uh, a lot of the legwork that 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 is necessary to make a project successful like this. So we're we're not going to frankly have the time to do for an entire year. We need to have my project managers working with the next gen vendors to, to track down issues to make sure that we're getting reschedules done to, to make sure that we're having success. So uh, that contract was awarded last week on Thursday. We closed out. Uh, we we had gone out to RFP uh, and we awarded contract to Promethean One, and they're working with some of the folks from uh, 911 Authority. They're coming on. We're having an onboarding meeting with them this week and they're going to hit the ground running. So they're going to be doing a lot of the outreach for us, helping us uh, contact PSAPs um, and uh, do a lot of you know, help us with a lot of the messaging, uh, some of the stuff that we need uh, additional additional bodies for. So very much looking forward to that. Um, they've got a great team. Uh, for those of you know, uh, that, that's a, uh, a really good firm. Promethean One does really good work. 911 Authority is is well known in the industry. They do really good work, so we're very excited. So. So that is ongoing now uh, with the intention of um, carrying that out through the year. Uh, that'll be our process through the year is pre-migration testing. Uh, upon successful testing, the goal will be to schedule carrier migration at each site that we have a, a full transfer cluster ready to go. So any place that we get a transfer cluster identified and ready, the goal will be to uh, go ahead and migrate traffic uh, within a month uh, from successful pre-migration testing date. So that's our big push right now. That's our really uh, our number one initiative uh, right now uh, on, on the project management side, on the network side. Uh, for call handling, uh, we continue to work through uh, you know, our, our process of, of uh, getting uh, vendors certified and we'll have a, a thorough update for everybody tomorrow at the advisory board for call handling uh, for you know the vendors that have been certified through the lab. Um, Ryan, anything to add? I'm trying to think. I think you you covered that is the process. I think one of the um, the uh, the parts that go maybe not according to the plan that we've already established is what we do when we do encounter those issues and how we get that rolled back in to the process, right? Obviously, like the ten month plan that Andrew just laid out was based on success, right? If we do the four piece out per day, four days a week, that equates to 10, 10 months. And obviously, the IT contractor coming on board is to support that, but what happens when we run into issues and we need that feedback loop to get those issues resolved, rescheduled, when we already have a 10 month deployment provided those all, all go successful, then yeah, of course we have you know a pretty straightforward plan. But in the event that we start to run into issues, it's how do we, you know, accommodate those while knowing that we don't we can't stop moving forward on those already pre-planned um, sites. Keep the momentum up, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I, I do have one question. Um, with the IT management firm, are they going to be um, subcontracting with any additional vendors beyond the 911 authority? And will there be visits to each individual PSAP? Um, good questions. Uh, I, they have outlined the personnel that they are providing for the project, and it's um, it, there, there are no other companies involved right so it's promethean one and 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 frankly it's just promethean one right they're they are partnering with staff from 911 authority but they're going to be reporting up through promethean one so it's not like a traditional subcontractor type role they're it's 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 one team for us um and as far as i know that's that's it uh, that's what they bid um and then uh, no the plan is not to have them physically go out to psaps uh, this is going to be helping us remotely helping us with work that can be done uh, at the office level yeah so there won't be any interface between them and the PSAPs. Like we're we're not we shouldn't be expecting emails or correspondence from them. You know, emails that we might delete if we have no idea that that's a company that's working for you all. Or how's that going to be pushed out to all the PSAPs so we know? Yeah. So great question, Jody. So we are we are aware that. Um, I'll just be honest. Even our emails go go to go to you know to the to what's the the rectangular file every now and then. So, um, knowing that a vendor is not going to have that name recognition and that and that 
um, you know, that that on site recognition from a PSAP. Uh, one of the plans we have, we were talking about possibly getting them OES email addresses as contracted vendors or as contractors. We can do that uh, for temporary access so they can at least have an OES email, right? So it's a little more recognizable. Um, they won't be interfacing, I'll, I'll clarify, face to face with PSAPs. They won't be going out on site. Uh, they will be interfacing, you know, phone, Teams, email, that sort of thing. Uh, they will have direct contact with you a little bit. Um, they're supposed to be helping us with uh, the, the schedule building, the notification, that sort of thing. And so we're hoping that if we can get them OES email addresses, that'll help uh, with that portion of it. If we can't, we're going to have to rethink that strategy a little bit and probably have our team be um, a little more engaged maybe than we had hoped uh, to, to physically be the one to send that email or make that phone call, right, for that familiarity for the PSAP. And then in terms of testing, um, is this testing going to be done in the background or is there going to be uh, expectation that us at the PSAP level are going to be interacting with them back and forth to do this testing? There is some interaction, yeah. So we do need a, a call taker who can who can answer some calls, transfer some calls. Yes. Similar to a Tiger team. Thanks for that uh, information, that update. A lot of good information there. A um, couple of questions, and uh, this being my first meeting here, if this is uh, not really the scope here, uh, feel free to tell me so. My feelings won't be hurt. Um, but uh, from a region perspective, or maybe even the groups that we represent here, is there anything we can do to assist uh, with your guys' team as you're you know taking on this, whether it be messaging, um, you know, be happy to take that on and help out. And then the second question is you talked about after the pre-migration being done um, and then eventual migration to uh, the next gen system, if we will. Um, we had talked at some of the regional task force and then again at the OES call. Is there a consideration or a plan to possibly roll that out county by county, kind of like we did text to 911? So uh, I'll take your first question, uh, which was you said, how can you how can you guys help? Um, the the big thing for us, as always, is 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 time is working against us, right? We have a schedule um, that we're trying to meet, and for a day, it it it's a lot. Um, so our ask would be that if if you are able to talk to your organizations, talk to your your neighboring PSAPs, um, any help that we can get to keep the schedule as close to original as possible is a, is a big, big deal for us. Every piece up that has to move because of vacations or, you know, something that that maybe we could work around um, is 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 a problem for us. It snowballs, right? Uh, and, it, and it creates delays. We're already going to have enough of that with PSAPs that don't pass testing that will that will really want to uh, save all of our time on the back end for those. And so um, any any um, help that that you can provide and just making sure that the PSAPs are are aware that this is happening. Awareness is always a problem for us with for a state this big with this many PSAPs. So awareness and uh, just accommodation so that that communication out from you guys is is very helpful for us uh, so that we can um, uh, get the PSAPs to understand that that please please be accommodating. Let it, let us test on the day that we that we're trying to test. Uh, which leads into the second question: If we can't, if we can't keep the schedule as is, we've designed it to try and hit transfer clusters. Now, not necessarily county by county. You think of like Orange County. You, you know, you're you're transferring to LA all the time. You're transferring to San Diego all the time. So uh, we definitely um, are looking at regions, and we're looking at how many PSAPs do you transfer to? Or how many do you accept from? So rather than a county by county rollout, we're looking, it, it, it equates mostly to region by region, uh, but it's even pockets within that, but it doesn't always align to the county borders. That makes sense, thank you. Uh, going back to what Ryan, you had said about dealing with issues that are identified, Mm -hmm. um, you've acknowledged that there would be. Does OES have a plan for dealing with those issues, identifying them, tracking them, determining how they're going to affect clusters and the ability to go live? Talk to your punch list. I think that's a religious question. Sure. sure. Um, so what we're doing is we are, um, we've, we've got a kind of a universal resource, uh, it's a teams group uh, where we've where we've put um, 
punch lists essentially, right? So for each PSAP that they go to, uh, we do our testing, or Autos does their testing. We're we're a little more hands off this time, right? As with Tiger Team, our our OES personnel were actually the ones conducting the testing and and doing the notation. So now Autos is doing their own testing. So we're a little bit more hands off, but uh, we go through, we conduct Autos's testing, um, and we notate the, the passes and the fails. And anything that fails goes on a punch list for that specific piece app and it gets uploaded to the teams group so everyone has access to it and everyone on the project or the next gen vendors and the cpe vendors all have access to it um, so that there is essentially a, a list for each piece app of work that needs to be done the expectation is that those vendors are logging in and looking at those lists and actively working those lists with uh, with my team uh, where, where needed, right? The project managers were needed with Ryan's team where needed for the engineering side. Um, but the expectation is on them to to keep that effort moving in parallel to to additional testing, right? Um, I was on the phone with uh, AT&T just prior to, to coming in here and we're finalizing details on how that's going to work. Now AT&T obviously is the lion's share of call handling in the state. So uh, in a lot of ways, once we've secured AT&T's help with call handling or, or services with call handling, then that takes care of a, a large chunk of, of the state. So um, we are working uh, with them right now uh, to secure uh, technician availability to get help on those punch lists to make sure that anything that is CPE related gets handled by AT&T and so forth. And, and obviously we're having those conversations with the other CPE vendors as well, um, just on smaller scale. Did that answer your question, Melissa? Yes, mostly. How is the PSAP being? How are the PSAPs being kept in the loop as to that process? How do they know that they're on the no the no go list? And how do they know when they come back off of it? Will they just be rolled back into a new pre migration date? Most of them aren't asking. Most of them, you know, they conduct the testing and okay, see you later. You know, we'll we'll see you when you see you. Uh, I know CHP is a lot more involved, right? And you guys are definitely um, like to be a lot more uh, involved in the testing and the notification. But for most PSAPs, um, we're going through, um, we're conducting testing, and um, you know, there's no um, formal notification to the PSAP or formal sign off to the PSAP saying, "Okay, you're ready." Uh, what we will do is once we have a cluster identified that we're going to go live at, then you're going to get notifications in. It's going to be, hey, we're going to be going live. There's going to be things that we're going to have to do to get you live. Uh, but for the testing portion of it, let's say a PSAP fails, um, you know, that we're really just working with a call taker or a dispatcher kind of in the moment on the floor. Um, we're not, it's not generally a whole thing with the PSAP. So um, if testing fails, we wrap. We conduct as much as we can, right? And if there's if there's issues, we we notate and we go back. Um, if we pass, we wrap, um, and then they go on they go on the pass list, right? We actually built a dashboard for this as well, uh, so we can uh, we can, we're going to show that tomorrow at the advisory board as well. So we will have a dashboard that'll be publicly available. So we want to include that as part of our messaging. And to your point, Jeff, if there's a way you can help us with that too, uh, this dashboard will be searchable. It'll be uh, toggleable by region, county, or PSAP. So you can go in and look and see when your scheduled date is and see how that see how your results look worked out. So we think that'll help quite a bit um, with with PSAP awareness for those that want to be aware, they'll they will have that tool, right? And for those that don't care, for lack of a better word, those that aren't as involved, um, you know, we will we'll put them back on the schedule and notify them as you know, as appropriate. Either way, for retesting or for go live, they'll be notified. Okay. Yeah. So the dashboard's going to track pre migration mm -hmm. and migration. Mm -hmm. um, and that'll be sent out via a. On the OES, it'll be on the OES website. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Casey. <laughs> so uh, just one uh, slight go back. When you talk about the pre migration uh, testing process that started this week, are there some PSAPs who in their Tiger team rollout already had pre migration and there's this different? Because I know some of them they, they did like I3 test calls and stuff, but this is more it's different than that. This is above okay. and beyond. Perfect. Yeah, this is above and beyond. Yeah. Just going to piggyback <laughs> off of Jess the ask and wonder um, when could we expect messaging to come from Cal OAS about Promethean 1 and the plan moving forward so that we can send the messaging out from the county coordinators? 
Uh, so we'll be messaging it. Well, we'll be messaging it tomorrow at the advisory board, of course. Um, if you're looking for something more formal, uh, we're having our kickoff meeting with them next week or this week. Me and we'll, we're 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 building that documentation right now. Um, I don't have a date for you. Uh, our kickoff is Thursday. So um, come Thursday, we'll we'll have a plan identified that we can start to put that material together and get it out. Um, expect it quickly. We're not we don't have time to to sit for weeks and weeks. So we'll get the kickoff going. We'll get the material prepared and have it out probably um, next week. Is it going to be my guess? Thank you. Yeah. Um, two things, PSAP testing. For those PSAPs that are conducting their own test plan between pre-migration and migration, when should that happen and how do they work with, who do they work with on your team or the vendor project team to make sure that they can do testing? Like test numbers are live and not broken for any PSAP that is doing their own post pre-migration test but pre-migration test, if that makes any sense at all. <laughs> well, I guess I would I would suggest, I don't know if it's possible, but I would suggest doing any any testing that you want to conduct at PSAP prior to pre-migration testing um, would probably be better because then you'll have resources on hand during, we call it PMT, pre-migration testing. During PMT, you'll have resources on hand to address those issues that you found in your testing. So I would actually suggest doing it prior if that's possible. Um, when will scheduling come out so that the PSAPs know when their pre-migration is going to be conducted? We have a schedule now. Um, I've got a schedule, a master schedule for, Q, well, for Q1. We're developing Q2 right now. Um, so I, if you, you know, if a PSAP is interested, obviously we'll, we'll hand that out. We'll get you your schedule. Um, most PSAPs are, you know, they just want, they just want lead time. They don't want to know the whole schedule. They just want to know when theirs is and they want enough time to plan for it. Right. So um, right now we're giving two weeks notice prior to, to showing up to individual PSAPs. Um, if you need more than that, um, just reach out to me individually and I'll get that for you. And then the, uh, oh, sorry, Casey, again, we're like, I'm getting there. Uh, <laughs> the other uh, question along with that then is, do we have like, a, an, and I know it's gonna be different for every PSAP, but an estimated time commitment uh, for the PSAPs when they have someone on board there? That's a tough one. Um, I think we, we're, well, we're scheduling all day. Uh, we're scheduling nine to two just to be, safe that alone is helpful yeah we're scheduling all day um right now we're seeing uh the short ones the shorter ones are um a couple of hours two hours i think but the longer ones where we, where we do run into issues where we're seeing the, they're lasting the full the full stretch so i'm trying to we're formulating very specific questions right now, but I'm trying to look ahead to the fact that you want to get to migration, right? And the goal. there's all these tiny little pieces that have to fall into place in order for that to happen, including PSAP knowing that they've been pre-migrated, right? And knowing that migration is happening so that they can look at their telltales differently, for example, and understand that they're on an entirely different network. Uh, so how is that being globally communicated so that if you hit issues, the PSAP knows what to do. And if you don't hit issues, everybody is ready to go, so to speak, if that makes sense for an actual migration. Because again, there's a lot of little things that are happening in the background that the PSAP doesn't necessarily know about or need to know about unless they become more intimately involved in the process. But when it comes time to migrate and their data looks different, for example, you need to know that they're on board, essentially. So how do we, how is that being developed and how do we help that process so that we can get to the end of the year and next year in a way that's together and realistic? Well, I would say that that process has, has been ongoing for, for some time. I mean, we've been messaging this for a, a long time, trying to, to get people to understand the changes that are coming. Um, more specifically, now that we've seen the telltales and we've seen the differences, on screen, we I mean, we did the the town halls. What was that two weeks ago? Right, we had 450 total participants across four of those. So that's a that's a good outreach, um, and we did talk quite a bit about that topic on those. Um, you know, we we 
over the over forever. I mean, I guess since since we've been in existence, we 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 try to message as best we can through the channels that we have. Calnina, uh, you know, APCO, these boards, uh, town hall meetings, task forces. Um, you know, we we have these tried and true methods that we message through. Um, but to my earlier point, Alicia, some PSAPs aren't engaged, and and we will never get to them uh, until you go knock on their door, and even then they. Who are you? You know, so um, we we've been working through this for some time and we've been building up to this for some time messaging uh, whether or not we've hit everyone. I I would guarantee probably not because uh, that's the nature of the of the of the beast, um, but we certainly try and then we've uh, we have adapted branch memos. Um, we've put stuff on the website. I mean, we're we're trying to get the messaging out there, but that is you you said it. That is where your participation is is crucial because if you're going back to your various professional groups and and messaging this for us and amplifying our message that that's only going to help for, for our groups i think what is helpful is a bit of a bigger picture like having the schedule the individual psaps may not want or need a visibility to that yeah. but to be able to get you know the entire chp the entire sheriff's association on board and have an understanding at that higher level it would be helpful to be able to provide kind of a package to them that says this is what we've done so far right we can all speak to that on our own but to be able to say here's the schedule for q1 here's the schedule for two, q2 and it doesn't have to be piece up by piece up but it needs to kind of speak to the story that we're trying to to tell and to enable the project moving forward yeah yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, just let, I mean, I'll get you any material you need, and and if you guys are using that for, for that purpose, um, to to help us message on a larger scale, absolutely, I'll get you whatever you need. also touched on call handling I don't believe that's a separate topic correct no are there any are there any questions about call handling I think we've covered next gen pretty well can you share who's in labs and who's on the street coming out soon yeah, sure. So who's in labs is Carbine and Trotto and Motorola. Those are the ones actively working to get past phase two so that they can get to that certification to sell. The three that have already been in past since quite some time is uh, NGA, Lumen or Microautomation and Autos. So the three that are getting close, the, the intent there is um, they're all actively working right now. They've been actively working with the hopes that they can get to Calnina as part of that phase two completed, just like Autos, NGA, and, and microautomation. That's their goal, and we're uh, you know we're working towards that. How many PSAPs have you do you have signed with a new vendor, and how many? Like thirty, okay. I think, uh, or above thirty now. Yeah. How many right. deployed? Uh, still just Desert Hot Springs. Yeah, I think uh, right now it's been the same story for a while. Connectivity has been an issue behind the scenes, not to the PSAP. Connectivity is all established to the PSAP, but uh, behind the scenes, right, core to cloud connectivity um, has taken more time than we've been comfortable with or happy with. Um, it just is what it is. I'm not 100% sure what the, what the delays are. Are caused by from our next gen vendors, but they've certainly been delayed in getting those circuits in. Um, my understanding is most of them are in now, but we're configuring them, um, which is additionally taking too much time. So um, the circuits are our our main holdup for getting new deployments. Desert Hot Springs was a I don't know I won't call it an emergency deployment, but it, it was one where we had other considerations at stake, so we had to we had to do kind of a a workaround behind the scenes for the network. So the rest are in process, but it's it is um, it's taking time. But we've signed off on yeah, oh, I think over 30 now. Janae's team has. I for discussion on that. I'm trying not to go down a rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. Anything else on item three before we move on to item number four? All right, let's move on to recruiting and retention and uh, that contract that was set in place. How is that going? So uh, we got, what was it, 571 responses or 471 responses from dispatch from line level for the for the study. I was just looking at the number and now I'm now I'm blanking on it, but it was a, a good number. Um, the last time we spoke, we had 25 uh, manager uh, surveys returned and 50 in progress, which was not great. Uh, so we left that one open for a while. We left that survey open and we re-engaged uh, one on one with all of those that were still open. And uh, we are now we flip flopped on those numbers. Now we have 50 complete, uh, 25 that were still in progress. So good progress there. We got a lot more uh, responses from the management uh, level. I know that that was a an intense survey. Uh, it was quite long, right? <laughs> Uh, with numbers that that needed to be pulled and, and a lot of stuff that was not convenient and we we recognize that but we appreciate the engagement and, and those who did complete it so so the survey is um, I think we'll be uh, closing up uh, pretty soon here uh, I'm you know I'll, I'll have to uh, apologize Paul is the one who really runs point on this one and Don um, I get most of my information secondhand uh, but uh, we did get a good reversal on those numbers and we got some good engagement so um, That'll be closing up soon. I got the timelines here. Give me a second to see what's next. This is why you bring your computer, Ryan. <laughs> All right, let me get to it for you. All right, there. Um, so let's see uh, March. So right around the corner. What are we 10 days from March? Uh, we'll be closing that data collection and we'll be starting our analysis of that work with 911 authority. And uh, by May, uh, we'll have the first draft out of the staffing training and retention plan. So I'm very excited for that. So that'll be about the next meet time we meet here. That first draft should be out. So hopefully it's out with enough time for you guys to review it before we come here. So you can have some feedback on it, it would be ideal. So I think we'll I'll take a note of that and make sure that we um, we have that plan for the beginning of May. Be great, I think, to take a first go through on that and then dedicating some time in that meeting for feedback would be fabulous. And if, I mean, if that doesn't line up, then we'll do the next. I think meeting. it may have been intentional because the final draft is due in August, which is the next round of this. So it must have been somebody must have been thinking ahead. <laughs> So uh, yeah, we'll 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 put that on there for uh, for early May. Um, if you could let us know if that's not going to line up, because then we could potentially look at a special session if we need to, just to discuss that topic, so that we don't have to wait until the fall or the summer. Well, yeah, and that's when the final draft is due, right. anyways. The vendor is yeah. going to be, yeah, you know, they're going to be running out of time at that point. Right. So it's okay. just want to make sure that it pulls it up. Well, and if if there's an because um, I know we used to do quarterly plus two for the long range planning committee, and I know that that is recently we took we we went back to, to quarterly. So I don't know what the process is for adding a plus back on. And I don't know if, you know, obviously if that's if that's possible or not, but I would I would suggest if 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 unavoidable, uh, perhaps there's a, a, a way we can get the information to you. You guys can review it um, without having to do a you know all of this, but um, we'll 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 shoot for early May. That way we can we can meet and talk. <laughs> yeah. Five policy based routing. What do you got for us? Um. <laughs> So I think I uh, it, think it's important we start talking about it so that we're not blindsided by it. In all, now. In all seriousness, yeah, I think that this this board would I think that we need to um, request, um, you know, I guess ideas, action plans, and or uh, 
thoughts and suggestions from this board as to what we what we the state should be planning for because we know what the system is supposed to do right policy based routing is very different from alternate answer which is what we're all used to today um there's a lot of peace apps that that either aren't familiar with it or are scared of it or don't want it to change um for reasons good and and bad um so we i think that we would like to task the lrpc with with maybe helping us um uh, draft a plan or message something that we can uh, bring to the PSAPs that uh, isn't so scary, right? Because all you know, policy-based routing is is new; it's different. Uh, we just want to make sure that we are fully utilizing the system and not and not getting. Um, I don't want to say stuck; that's not the right word, but just not staying with with something that that we know because it's all we know. Uh, so if if there's um, I don't know how we want to approach this, how the how the advisory board or the LRPC wants to um, tackle this, but I think this is something that we would be excited to get some feedback on. Because technology is there. The technology isn't the problem, right? It's the it's the messaging, it's the training, it's the, the education. So I, I think what's important and most important for many PSAPs is the ability to have the routing in a neighboring agency function, as well as somewhere beyond. Let's say there's a critical incident that's in your region and just having the ability to have your calls answered somewhere else and how they would look to be processed and how that information would feed back to the originating PSAP that may be a part of the critical incident. Um, and I think those are some of the concerns that are kind of on the horizon like if we send our calls, we're in Northern California, we send our calls to Southern California, what is that gonna look like statistically for our PSAP in terms of funding, in terms of um, call volume, et cetera, et cetera? And what type of agreement are we entering into with the agency that's far away? Well, uh, it's fine. Uh, no, I, I I get it, Brenda, and I think that that is. Um, we talk a lot about sending calls wherever, right? You know, send them LA to Reading to San Diego to. It, it, I know it sounds great, but is it is it reality to do something like that? Probably not, right? You're probably going to keep things regional. In the case of the Bay Area, right? If you have a, a you know a gigantic earthquake, they got to go out of region, but how far? Right. Ideally, it'd be somebody who could still potentially respond. Hopefully, maybe. Um, so probably not Los Angeles, right? Um, but it's it's a fun thing to to message as a feature. Um, but I think that the the reality is that the MOUs have to be in place. Uh, you know, um, interoperable CAD, radio. That that stuff is a very very important piece of the picture. We're just one piece of this pie. So if we can send your calls to neighboring agencies, we're happy to to do so. Um, but I think it's it's important that we don't lose sight of the fact that the the PSAPs have um, a responsibility in this too to to form those MOUs with with partnering agencies. Now, in the case of a of a massive earthquake, uh, when it's you know all bets are off, I mean we can route calls where we where we need to route them. Um, for 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 funding, we can deal with that. That's all policy. That's just in house, and and we have in the past. We've dealt with PSAPs who have had specialty funding cases for a number of reasons. I I, I was an advisor for many many years, and uh, I personally dealt with several cases where we had oddball funding issues. So that I'm not worried about. We can we can work with you on that. Uh, but it's the interoperability thing that that is I think the bigger question here and the bigger task. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we were uh, talking about, you know, um, getting into uh, the CAD uh, RFP that we've been mentioning over the last uh, few months, uh, potentially log and recorder RFP, that sort of thing. Those, that's the reason really why we push those or why we were pushing those uh, is to, to help promote that interoperability that we think is, is not lacking, but certainly stronger in some areas than others, right? Uh, so I think that that's something that we'll, we will have to continue to work on um, and we'll have to make sure that the PSAPs are, are engaged. Thanks, Ryan. 
Am I answering your question? Is that, I mean, is that? Well, so that's a big one. <laughs> in a nutshell, yes. Yeah. Um, we do have interoperability with the radios currently. Mm -hmm. um, and just where and how would policy based routing look in comparison to that? You know, I understand mm -hmm. the MOUs and talking with other agencies to say, okay, We've had this major earthquake in Alameda County. Well, now it reaches beyond Alameda County because there may be some residuals in the neighboring sure. counties. Sure. So it would have to go a little further, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And how would that look? Perhaps all the way to Sacramento, right? Possibly. So uh, I think I'm probably stepping on Ryan's toes. You could speak to policy based routing much better than I can, but but he was nodding his head. Yeah, he can. But what I'm what and I'll pass it over to you, the baton here, but I would say that you'll your piece apps will want plans A, B, C, D, E, and F. A is, you know, calls ringing past 30 seconds. We want them to go here. Most people don't do that. B is gas leak. C is cratered. D is a region-wide earthquake that takes out everybody. Something like that would probably be what, what you would want to equip. And then uh, when the time comes, when that event happens, you know, you did initiate plan E, and then that sends your calls to Sacramento or something like that. Ryan, did I get it? Yeah, I think so. I think um, what what you, Brenda, and Alicia are trying to get at is is really that menu for the PSAPs to be able to really decide. I think step one is just to set up what that MOU is for just your normal alt answer PSAP, right? Not when the earthquake comes and you got to go completely ad hoc and, and come up with an idea right there on the fly. I mean, I, I want to know just from the very basics in the instances that we're working right with CHP, right? Their, their first question is we got alt answer to whatever, you know, their agency that they choose. And we need to make sure that that policy is in place and when you when do you enact that policy is it you know um, calling the knock is it auto policy where you just abandon your piece up by logging out of your vesta and 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 that happens you know that i think we're at that point of really trying to establish establish what that looks like at a very fundamental level and then you got the 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 more you know uh, exotic text you know use cases where you got to go to southern california or something you know to me, we haven't even really established what we have for the very basic policy. Proof of concept almost, right, Ryan? Like showing that it actually works. And and the call handling that we use today, while tried and true for alternate answer, doesn't have a, a, a large range of capabilities for policy-based routing. How many policies are there, Ryan? There's only a couple. Yeah, there's only a few, but, but we still need to define what that looks like, get that in front of the PSAP so they can set those MOUs across what you already have in place on the legacy side, but also to initiate that in the next gen core services, we need to know what that is so that they can pre-program Program those in the event that you need to use them. I know that's some of the, the, the concern that you have as we start to talk about the OSP migrations once we get past this pre-migration phase. What does that look like? Because then we're, we're, we're carrying live traffic. In the event that CHP needs to go into alt answer, do we have those policies already put in place? To respond to those those instances i think that's what we you know to me what the lrpc can help for the the greater community out there what this menu looks like so that when alicia and her chp centers are going through establishing what the policies look like for just the basic stuff everyone else can leverage that that, that work that she's been doing that's my opinion on what we could be doing at the LRPC, but I don't know, you could open up to you guys to, to see what you guys, I mean, if it's more of just information based and we need to start talking about what policy even looks like, maybe that's step one, and then we start to go into the menu. But, you know, we'll open it up to you guys and see what you guys think as far as how best to approach this as we start to move to that next phase of carrying actual live traffic where the policies actually mean something rather than the textbook theory of where we were over the last five years, say. Yeah, I, I do um, like and appreciate the whole menu option of sorts. However, defining at the yeah. the forefront is important before Absolutely. we start slicing and dicing mm -hmm. it down. Thank you. I think, you know, in the past, it, it, it is scary when we start talking about policy, right? Because 
in the past, it's just I just flip my switch and I know that my agency partners with say Alicia and we always have this agreement to, to just flip the switch and you get my calls or vice versa. But I think um, the story we often hear is like if the earthquake comes and all of Northern California is completely, you know, destroyed, we need to send it to Southern California starts to bring in those questions of, well, what are you going to do with my call? You don't, you don't have the same CAD. How are you going to get back to me? And then even to the 800 the, miles away. Yeah. What are you gonna so, do? I mean, it's scary, but yet we're at that point of actually carrying traffic soon. As we start to go through these next 10 months, there's going to be PSAPs carrying live traffic that are going to be faced with questions that Alicia has already brought to us. Well, if I go into all to answer, I need to know how to enact policy for just the simple flip the switch equivalent. So to me, it, it should be important for us to at least define what that looks like. Again, I know I've been saying that, you know, that's my theme, but I think it's important that we they nail that down. Yeah. Uh, so what about, and I, I know it's tough for us to work together without breaking rules, um, right? For us to communicate as a committee in a public fashion, but we, we do, we kind of need to work together to create a list of what do we want and what do we need, right? We need the equivalent of alternate answer. I want to be able to draw a circle around SoFi Stadium when there's an event there and have call takers handle that event without disrupting the rest of the comm center, mm -hmm. for example. So we need to draft something that is kind of those wants and those needs um, so that we can all take a, sit down and take a look at it and say, okay, these are reasonable needs and these are reasonable not wants. And some of these are just pie in the sky scenarios that aren't realistic for where we are today, maybe in the future. And then I think there's also a conversation about how can OES help? Can we have sample MOUs where somebody's got a great MOU? Let's put it up on a website somewhere if possible, right? Or a shared file or you know, funding from a say I need to program call handling in a certain way to make policy occur effectively. Is there funding available for that? So some of those FAQ type items that you know we can help develop through you know putting some of these agreements in place and you can help post and get information out there. Um, but we need an effective way of starting that list essentially creating a, a menu of what we want to see. Yeah, and I and I, I believe that that this group, the LRPC, was created for that express purpose. You can get the work done because you don't have the same uh, limitations that the advisory board does, where you get three more than three people in a room and you got to do the Bagley Keen thing and all that. We don't we don't have that here. So I mean, if uh, if there's work to be done, uh, I think it's it, this is a group to do it. Yeah, and I think we do have some of those rules just as a subcommittee of the advisory board, so we, we shouldn't set ourselves in a room together that's not public. Um, but, you know, somebody creating a list and then tossing it at somebody else and then tossing it to the yeah. next person. Yeah, a, working, a working draft, yeah. You know, that's... It's something to OES before our next meeting that can then go to the task forces, perhaps, for their For PSAP vetting, yeah, 100%. Would it be possible for us uh, if, if there was uh, interest in uh, working on this project of establishing a, an ad hoc of this, including some subject matter experts, uh, you know, from the technical side to, you know, look at all the options, make sure we're not missing anything. But, um, you know, that that might be an option. But the, the other thing I'll say about this is that um, as we look at this as a uh, large project, it's one of those things that is like one of those monster projects. You know, it, it can be very overwhelming to look at it from the back and you start thinking about, you know, CADs and how we're going to get calls and, you know, geographically diverse, all of those things. And, and I think that it's almost impossible to tackle like that. We have to break it down to the basics of, of what you, you know, stated at the beginning there and, uh, you know, make sure just on a basic level, let the PSAPs worry about some of those larger issues that come with how am I going to get the calls from one place to another? How's my CAD going to interact? Like, we need to be able to be focused on this just call delivery portion of it and how are we going to handle that? And how is, um, you know, the, the PSAP is going to look at that menu and decide 
to utilize the technology be the technology to the best of its ability, not dumb it down to what we've been doing for the past 50 years. And the citizens deserve that, the public deserves that. And so that's really where we have to put our focus on. And it is gonna be hard. There's gonna be, you know, peace apps that don't wanna change and are useful and things, but it, we're not doing anyone any favors if we're not leaning into the technology and finding the best way to serve the public. Agreed, well said. So, and I'm going to open up to everybody. Would it be best for us to throw ideas on a piece of paper and throw it at the task forces or the reverse of that? Have the task force members? Uh, the other way option right? A, yeah. Yeah, um, we, we've we worked on, uh, I guess I'll call them working meetings, like document working meetings to the task forces in the past. Um, it's a it's a narrow scope where that where that really works. Um, we, we can make it work, but in general, it's it's better if we're able to uh, get a document and do a, like a live review and and get feedback on the spot. Uh, that's that's generally more helpful, more productive. Can you guys provide us with what's possible technology wise? That way, when, as we're trying to work on this stuff, we know this is a no go, or these are the various options. Like, what can can't we do? Yeah, we could do that. Yeah, I think that that's. Yeah, we could do that. I mean, but that is kind of the 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 template, right? That we're trying to come up with, right? If we come up with all. Well, she's she's making sure they don't go, you know, too pie in the sky, right? Like we, we got to make sure we establish some ground rules for when they, you know. Sure. Sorry, we're the basics of what the technology can support, and then beyond. Well, that, what, just so we have a what best and Viper can support, right? Yeah, right. That's kind of where I I wanted to hear your guys' feedback to see what you guys would even want to do as a piece out and then see if we can align that to a technology or a capability within there that that would be able to support it rather than just saying here's all you're going to you, you can get this you know what i'm saying there's like both sides to the story because i know in the past we we've come up with that but it scares a lot of people because if you start saying yeah you could start routing your calls to southern california they're like well no thank you we're good <laughs> I'll, I'll do policy based routing future or you know versus let me hear what you guys want to do and i'll go back to the vendors and say hey look there's a real need that the PSAPs feel they want to be able to do something as simple as that or as exotic as that and then we'll come up and say yeah i'll align that to a, a error code or something to that extent to, to show that we can actually support that rather than me just saying here's what you get now figure out if you like these or not do you know what i mean so what yeah. you're looking for is the exact opposite. You want us to come up with all the variables and then you are going to well, come back and say that's possible technology. It's an option. I just don't want to waste time if you're if you already know that's not possible. X, Y, and Z is not possible. I get where you're coming from. Yeah, I mean, we could, I guess that's a, we could debate which way. I mean, I certainly can get you that and get a list. I think we probably already have that list. It's just, I don't want to make it so either scary or or confining Confi yeah exactly i rather but that's just my opinion because i've seen how this all plays out but if you guys want that to start then certainly we can set that up as kind of the, the baseline template i think it might be helpful because you're way down in the weeds on a day-to-day -day basis and we're not so it may be helpful for us to have some concept of what we can do like if we can't transfer I would say to Mexico, for example, it'd be good to know that, right? <laughs> but you know what I mean? But that's a real live scenario that we would want to do. And if you say, well, you know, international transfers are not a capability right now, that would go on to our list of we need this, but we understand that yeah, it's not. That's what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah, don't 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 confine yourselves to the box that Ryan provides you is the is the takeaway here. You know, if he gives you the list of what we're cap what we can do today, think outside of that. What else? Because you can't. If you don't ask, you don't know. And then if we don't know what you want, we can't ask the vendors to provide it. So we can be that go between for you. Would it be uh, like some of examples of what we're looking for as like some of the discussions that I've heard so far on this topic would be, you know, establishing a menu that PSAPs can choose from, for example, of making a selection between operator busy versus operators offline or do once you break that down geographically diversify if you have other piece you want to split rotate your calls and stuff like that so are those the kind of options you would like us to work through that's what i think 
I mean, I, I know we've kind of done this exercise among CHP centers of getting her wish list of things that she wants in the next gen environment and then trying to align that to ways that we could support that. And if it's too hard, then we come back and we kind of negotiate with Alicia and her CHP centers to come to a happy medium. But to me, I, I just don't want to say, well, here's here's how we're going to do alt answer. Here's how we're going to do, you know, these various policy scenarios that are per the textbook, if you will. You know, there's not a lot of, um, I mean, Alicia, you have all kind of custom things that you would want that aren't necessarily going to be in my menu that I would give you from the from the baseline, if you will. Yeah, and I, just to give some perspective, because we are kind of knee deep in this as well at CHP in testing, things like I need to bring inland live. Um, inland is a giant region, right? It's the entire inland empire, but in order to support everything around it, we need to bring inland live. Inland needs an alternate answer in case something happens, right? Inland's alternate answer is way over in Indio, for example. India is not ready to be live. How do I alternate answer I3 calls that may end up at Inland to Indio successfully? That's a policy, right? We need to write that policy. And that's what I need. Your technology at OES may not be able to do that right now, but we need to define that I need this thing so that the vendors can work toward it. And that's just one real life example of, of you know, thousands of different scenarios. Exactly. So that's why I asked on the PSAP side, how, you know, if you can come up with a general list of like a, a few of the things that generally you would like to have happen, and then we align that to the best policy to support that. That's to me how we should do it rather than just saying, here's the three things that you would get at a very high level, knowing that we can come up with some custom workarounds if we need to, like the international calling or, you know, a 10 digit all, you know, policy to, to go to 10 digit if the, the on net stuff isn't working. But to me, we need to start to figure out based on the PSAP's concerns and, and real life scenarios on how they want calls to be treated and then align that to policy. And that's our biggest hurdle, right? Is today PSAPs want it manual. They want the ability to flip the switch and send calls. And that's the one thing policy based routing doesn't do. So that's that's a hurdle that we need to overcome too. When we're talking about this, we need to to understand how do we get past that 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 mindset that it's going to be okay if we automate this. And I think what's important as well is to survey our organizations and the PSAPs that are that are there, and determine what do you do now. What would you want to do in the future? Mm -hmm. How can we support the next gen project? if we are not able to receive or process a call here at our center. And I think it'll become standard list. It'll become like a, a part of the checklist when you buy new CPE, the cloud-based CPE that has far more options uh, than what are available to us today. Uh, I would assume that that's gotta be part of that installation. Like, okay, let's set your codes. Let's set your policies while you're getting it installed. And so that'll probably start to, um, create a uh, you know a, a knock on effect we'll get more and more of these done as that call handling gets out there and i think options are important so yeah and everybody has a voice is yeah. there any plan at like calina or apco or anything where cal oes has this as a topic to sit and talk through this with any managers because i know i know a lot of the issue is not everybody's involved but if you're attending calina or apco you're likely more involved and yeah. maybe a little more knowledgeable about the tech and all that so is there a plan to have and sit down related to this or we, something along those lines. We did a ton of these, but I think we did them too early. We were doing this like two years ago, three years ago. We were doing all these policy-based routing breakouts and people were just not understanding what we were talking about. So um, I think I think we're too little too late for the upcoming Cal Nina, right? Call for papers is already in, but I don't know what we submitted for. I should probably know that. <laughs> yeah, we pull the schedule. Yeah, and, and that's a difference, right? That's that's very much a difference. Um, but but agreed. Um, and I think that now that reality is going to be setting and 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 let's be clear with network migration and OSP migration, you know, if we um if we're still on the same CPE, 
the options are limited and we can set a baseline like Ryan's talking about. Here's your option A, B, and C. It's all you get today until you switch over. And so we we'll we'll have not a lot of time, but we'll have the time to be able to continue that outreach and continue that messaging. Um, and then we'll have to check. I think Alicia's checking the Calina schedule right now. But uh, yeah. But even that would be good to know, like, hey, you're on this, you know, old older CP system. This is all you're getting. And so that might be where you come in and say, this is all you're getting technology wise. But if you switch and to go to whatever this other vendor is, then look, you have all these other opportunities yeah. for things like He's, when they do go wrong. And other the, options. That is easier said than done, though, Jody. I mean, we we were trying that when we first started rolling things out and we got a pretty good backlash from PSAPs. They wanted that manual process in place. And so that's why we went down that rabbit hole of calling the knock to do alternate answer, which takes like 30 minutes. It's it's a terrible process, but it was the only thing that we could do in lieu of, of policy-based routing. It was the only thing that was somewhat of a manual process like you guys are used to. So we 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 did briefly go down that path of like, hey, this is what you're going to get, and we got we got a lot of heat for it. So um, we tried to correct, uh, but it it hasn't been very successful. That process is is getting better, right? That that calling into the knock to get that manual reroute done. But it's think about when you call AT and T today or or Frontier, right, for your network. If you need a manual reroute to a PSAP that's not on the same selected router, it's like a, it's like two hours for them to get that done. It takes forever. If it's not automatic, if it's not to that, you know, if you don't have the switch in place, uh, so it's 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 like that, right? It's definitely a, a, it's it's cumbersome. So, but if you're saying you'll help us with that messaging, we would love to go back to, hey, this is what it's going to be. The manual process is going away. We don't have that to offer you anymore, unless you want to sit on the phone with a knock, which nobody does. That would be great if 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 you guys could help us with that with your professional organizations. We have a few of those. I mean, that was Indio's big, big thing is they, they, um, not Indio, um, sorry, um, Imperial, um, getting my, my eyes crossed up there. So, uh, they, that was a big roadblock to go live, uh, before we went live there last year is they did not enjoy that alternate answer process. And so, um, we worked with them. We got it down to a semi manageable amount of time for them to do that. Um, but it's not, the answer. And so we have those PSAPs that have had that lessons learned and that we can utilize their experience to say, hey, this is this is not what you want, guys. Let's talk about policy based routing to see if it's any better. Yeah. Jeff, you've been waiting forever, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we ended up circling around and answering your question. <laughs> Okay, so I think the next question is who's going to start this list on our end so that we can actually put pen to paper? Do I, do I have any volunteers? I can start it. Okay. Yeah. Tag team it around. And get it to you as soon as we possibly can. I'll put a uh, draft together before the end of the week and send it to the group and you guys can just start, you know, track changes, whatever we want to do on it. Sounds great. Sounds good. Okay. And then we'll have to make sure it's an agenda item next time. Stay by the agenda. Perfect. All right. Any other comments on policy-based routing. All right, let's talk about re regionalization and consolidation. This is a topic that has been gone for a while from the table and is creeping its head back onto the table again. And I think it's really relevant with next gen coming yeah. our way. And and for some background, you you said it. It was it was it was the topic du jour for a long time and then it sort of went away. Um, Back when we first were absorbed by OES, when the 911 branch came to OES, Alicia, I think you might have still been working here at the time. It was Mark Gilarducci was our director, and he said, I, and I quote, I want one piece out per county, <laughs> which we kind of said, okay, well, that's that's aggressive. <laughs> um, obviously, that never happened, but, um, you know, the fact is 440 PSAPs is a lot. It's it's a lot. Uh, over half of our PSAPs are two and three position. Over, you know, it's it's a large number of PSAPs that are that are that are small. And you know, our small PSAPs definitely have an important purpose and and a place. And everybody you know does a great job in this state of answering 911 calls. Um, however, with the state of 
the industry as far as staffing goes, you know, one of the things we've talked about is how does regionalization and consolidation help with that? How do we have ADP SAPs in Los Angeles County? Not to pick on you, Josh. ADP SAPs in Los Angeles County. You know, we have you can you can throw a rock and hit five of them at any at any place in the San Gabriel Valley. Are there opportunities here where these people could still, you know, potentially uh, keep that job, move move to another uh, dispatch center, or or have a regional dispatch center for all you know these five agencies, uh, where people aren't getting let go, right? People aren't losing their jobs, but the staffing question gets answered at the same time because more calls are coming in, you know, to to a single center. We we thought that that might be a relevant conversation. With that uh, being something that is a a goal to be put out there. It seemed very fitting for this group to to talk through and to get suggestions as to what what can we do, what can OES do, uh, what can your groups do to to message um, message this. We have technology now finally coming into being that can help with this, um, you know, with with cloud based call handling and and uh, potentially even you know remote call handling. I don't I don't want to say that out too loud, but I mean it's on everyone's mind. Right. Some states do it. Some countries do it. <clears throat> Not saying that's a path we're heading down, but would these need to be items that we discuss and topics that we discuss? And so um, what we want to talk through at OES is. You know, short of writing legislation. You know, what what, what can we do in policy legislations? It, it's tough, right? That's that's hard to get through, but policy we can do things. So do we uh, you know do we create financial incentives for for PSAPs to do this? Do we do we pay a chunk out to pay for something else? You know, I mean, it has to be within the the bounds that were allowed by the FCC, right? There's a there is a list of things that we're allowed to to give you money for as PSAPs, but if we can stay in those bounds, is that an option? Um, these are this. We we thought this was an important topic that we can that we can start to bring back to the table. Is there anything at all within the retention and recruitment contract that is going to lend towards? Hey, maybe you should think about consolidation, in California. I haven't read it. I don't know. It's been a while <laughs> since I looked at it. Yeah, uh, I I I I don't know, Alicia. I'll have to get back to you on that. Yeah, could you yeah. take that back? I, I I have to imagine there's something in there about it. I mean, it's 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 uh, and uh, one of the obvious ones in my mind, right? For for potential paths forward. Because I think that's one of we keep we talk about it, but it's just our opinion, right? It's the world according to the way we view it, representing our various organizations. Having a third party come and say other entities are doing something different that we believe would be helpful to you and it looks like regionalization or consolidation that would be useful to have so that we can use it as a tool to discover but also be able to make some decisions and on the topic of decision and decision makers um those uh police chiefs sheriffs would probably want to know Who's going to be in charge of the regional centers? Are they willing to relinquish any power? That's a big one. Um, to say, I'm going to send all my staff over here under the umbrella of the regional center, which is governed by who? So, and how do we present that? That's why this is a, a very much a long range issue, right? Because setting up those MOUs takes time, right? We we have several examples in the state very very successful ones rcc being probably one of the the shining stars of of of, of that example right of, a, of an agency that is that has several um you know peace apps or, or police departments uh sheriffs not sheriffs but police departments in their jurisdiction that they answer for and it's um you know it's a jpa right so that's that's what makes this a, a, a long range issue because those are the that's the that's the the long lead time is getting that uh, getting everyone to agree because nobody wants to give up their kingdom. We we understand that, and that's why we have 440 PSAPs. <laughs> so I'm off of Brenda's point. We're experiencing that same problem in Stanislaus County right now, where it's we don't want to relinquish control over our smaller PSAP. For example, we have a small PSAP um, that's been at 50% staffing. They've had six dispatchers left. Five of them left to come over to the JPA. 
they're sitting with one dispatcher and they're bringing in officers to do dispatch just to try to keep their PSAP alive. We have the same problem with the two other smaller PSAPs in our region. So some sort of incentive, whether it be financially or some position from the state saying, hey, we support regionalization. This is our official position. Off Brenda's point would be helpful um, to kind of deploy in the fight to keep these JPAs and these regional centers together. Yeah, and, and in your case, it's already there. The JPA exists, it's, we're operating it. I mean, that's, that's in my mind, that's a slam dunk, right? Like that should be something that a P, I know it's not, should be, but that's something that a PSHAP should be willing to do because you're only sending calls there. It's not like you're losing officers or you're losing, you know, it's, it. I think it's a mindset thing more than, than, than anything. And um, in our operations manual, it it says in there you should if in the section where it tells you how to buy your CPE and where to get your funding and how to go through that step by step, it says right at the top of the front the state 911 office recommends consolidation and regionalization where appropriate. So that has been our position for a while, uh, but it's it's something that um, you know if we're just saying it 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 it's not enough. So we need to start to to do a little bit more. I think. Agree. Yeah. I was uh, in, uh, we were in, Ryan and I were in Illinois uh, visiting their state office a little while ago, and uh, they have a, a, a law on the books uh, in, in Illinois state legislation that says uh, no new PSAPs, period. doesn't matter. Yeah, so they have 126, I think, or something like that. I can't remember. Yeah. can't remember. Anyway, it doesn't matter, but they, they can't have any more. They're, they're not, so if one closes down, it doesn't get replaced. They got to go somewhere. So, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a big one, right? Legislation is is a is a drastic action, but it's it's something that I thought was um, a clever way for a state to address uh, that that over overcrowding of PSAPs. I think uh, this is one of those topics that, um, much like the uh, policy based routing, is just an enormous you know topic to to look at and think of. Um, there's a lot of examples. Um, of where consolidation in this industry uh, has been successful. There's a lot of examples where it's been recommended and, and discarded. You know, just the county that I uh, work in, um, San Diego County, you know, we've paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for consultants to come in and yeah. we have reports on paper and it didn't mean anything. You know, at the end of the day, it was thrown away because of things like local control building, local control. you know. So, um, you know, as we think about, you um, you know what what could we look towards towards the future and and uh you know i know you said from like a financial standpoint this probably is not a realistic thing but you know if, if buildings and facilities were you know a part of that that might be more of a leaning because i know that's one of the things in our county that derailed it you know was was uh location and funding and everyone having to chip in so brick and mortar right yeah I mean, yeah so uh, anyways it, this is a massive one and uh, i think it's a it's a it's a tough one just getting over the personalities and the local control mm -hmm. um and then you know when you don't even talk about like existing leases or mous and all, all the other things in place it, it, this is a massive one and uh we have a lot of scars in uh, san diego from this topic <laughs> yeah i remember well i i think that we would just ask that um you know as we as we discuss this topic, um, we can we can do what we need to do through policy at OES, right? We we have a lot of control that we can exert, and we've used that in the past, right? For um, new PSAPs coming on board, that's why we set the the minimum number of monthly calls at twelve hundred calls a month, nine one one calls, not not ten digit and all that. So we we've, we've set that bar, you know, somewhat high, so that we don't get a lot of new applicants anymore, and we can disqualify those who come in who, you know, who want to be PSAPs. Um, sometimes agencies get a waiver. There are other uh, factors at play here. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing is that we um, we we don't have the ability to set policy in county. If a if a county agency, uh, and I mean a locality, not not like a sheriff, but I mean like a city or or an entity in the county, is um, not happy with the rate that they have to pay to the county sheriff to get the calls answered or if they're not happy with the service and they want to become a PSAP and there's no other alternative we don't necessarily have that legislative authority to say county sheriff you need to charge them x amount per call in order for this to be fair we can't do that so that's a, that's a big strike uh, that's that's not going in our favor that we that um, works against us here so 
if there's a way we can that we can reverse that and help even help small agencies who potentially want to become peace apps get them the resources to to stay where they are either running through their calls through the county or something that would be even helpful um I, we just need to be looking at all options i think because the number is actually growing we, we've actually added i think three peace apps this year or in the last couple of years i should say in the last like three years we've added like three or four so we were on a good downward trajectory we were um down to 438 uh, from our all-time high of 465 was think our all-time high back in the way back um but now we're creeping back up we're back at like 441 now so Andrew, when you guys look at that um, and what they say is an unfair price from the local sheriff's office or wherever, um, do you compare it to what their what their uh, costs are going to end up being, or is that just something they throw out? Or when they're saying service where they used to be, um, say another uh, center. Uh, do they have to give like actual reasons or it's just something that is thrown out there and no, they want to open their own center? So it's a good question, Aaron. We don't have the, the Warren Act is, is, is fairly narrow in its scope, right? So we don't have a lot of um, say, like I said, we don't have a lot of say over who can and can't be a piece. Well, we, we we do get to say who can be a piece app if they meet the qualifications that we set out. Um, but what it doesn't say is, yeah, who gets who are, you know, do we have the statutory authority to shut a piece app down? We have the statute authority, statutory authority to send them to the attorney general's office. But that's got to be a pretty serious, you know, situation if we're going to do that. Um, but it doesn't it doesn't say anything about that topic, right? That you're talking about with with county county rates or uh, level of service. Uh, you know, it 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 really stays silent on that. Now we have addressed a lot of that in policy as far as P.01 grade of service and things like that. But but really, I, I mean, the answer is 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 no. I mean, we can go anecdotally. If I've got paperwork from Tehachapi from 10 years ago and they were fighting with Kern County, and then uh, somebody comes in from Alameda County, for example, I can compare those anecdotally here in the office but but no i don't have the ability to to go out and and gather that data or or you know force peace apps to hand it over um they'll give us data you know if a peace app wants to break away from their county uh, they'll provide the paperwork and 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 if we're going with a peace app that doesn't meet our requirements and they're pushing uh, we will absolutely make it um there, there's a large paper trail that comes with that right because we're we're trying to disincentivize peace apps from from coming on if they're too small uh, but at the end of the day um no it's it's one of those things that if if they're unhappy with the service and their citizens are not getting the service that they feel they deserve from 911 um then if the peace apps got the funding they got the building they got the officers they got everything there's you know um if they are able to um follow the process get us the documentation and appeal successfully if they're in the case that they're small then there's not a lot we can do we, we bring them on board um so yeah it's it's if if you as part of this group maybe uh, if we can talk through documentation and uh, rates maybe specifically even uh, that'd probably be pretty helpful of what you know what your county sheriff charges local peace apps in your counties or your jpa or uh, you know, uh, just so that we can start to see what these rates look like. I mean, I've back when I was an advisor, I knew like the rates for like consolidated fire, you know, like Verdugo and Downey and and some of the larger fire centers in LA. I knew what they were charging, but that was just because I was in the mix every day. Uh, but if we had that data, it probably would help us out. Okay, thanks. concept of transparency is interesting and could be very enlightening to peace apps who go through this on a recurring basis. Um, You're talking about public shaming? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> I mean, it works. Um, the other way of looking at it, though, is not necessarily focusing on the decentivization 
but focusing on those who are interested, right? Those who want to make it happen. Absolutely. And have the cooperation. What can OES do? Like facilities is one big item. It's very expensive to try and find land and build onto it. And if the state can do anything to help that, then great. Or the professional technical expertise to be able to design a building that's appropriate for a giant PSAP, even just paying for those personnel that maybe an entity can't, you know, come by via contract. That might be helpful. I mean, maybe we just kind of flip it on a 10 and look at, well, if what can we do? What can yeah. we do? If everybody's on board, what can OES do? What would we need from the PSAP community and our organizations to make that easier on all of us, I suppose? Yeah, and I imagine physical facilities is probably top, a top three, I would say, right, for, for a lot of these. Um, Local control is probably number one. Uh, honestly, I think that's the biggest problem that we have to solve. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we're willing to look into that, whatever we can do to help. Or even to Alicia's point, identifying vacant land space that this building, Field of Dreams, could be, you know. Um, ultimately, existing buildings don't always have all the requirements or capabilities that are necessary to move into the next generation of 911. Sure. If we're able to erect a building that would um, give us the leeway to just design and formulate how we could coexist in the space would be great. Um, but First and foremost is just identifying. Does the state have any vacant land space that could be considered uh, available for use? Sure, and I guess what I would recommend is I would I would suggest if if you if your counties or your neighboring agencies are looking into something like this, I would say um, consider us a resource for uh, not yet. I don't want to go on record saying we are a resource. Consider us a potential resource for funding, uh, but I would not, if I were you, in any way, shape, or form rely on the state to do the actual work because then it's going to take you years and years and years and years, you know, just getting through the red tape. So once you start getting DGS and building involved, you know, and, uh, DGS buildings um, and uh, all of the stuff that we have to do, the site planning and all that, um, I wouldn't. I don't even know where to start. So I would say it'd probably be wiser to look at it from a local level and then engage with OES for, for funding to support. But uh, uh, we will, I'll commit to taking that offline with OES leadership and, and seeing if that's something that we would be interested in or able to do. So on that topic. on to regional task force briefings. I think we have one or two folks here ready to brief. Yeah, uh, we do. Uh, we made a boo-boo. Um, so Janae and Dawn uh, are kind of, they got the training wheels off. They're running the task force now. Uh, so Ryan and Paul and I are kind of stepping away a little bit uh, to let them step up and, and start to lead a little bit. Uh, so they ran the task forces. I wasn't at any of them this quarter for the first time ever. And so uh, I let them go to Orange County today for the county meeting. So we, we didn't check calendars. And so they are not here to provide their brief out. But I think we do have some some members in the audience. I don't know, Josh, you, you didn't go, did you? Why not, man? Grab a mic. Double whammy for LA County um, on Greg's dispatchers called off sick, so he was actually in the chair. Um, and I had a similar issue at our dispatch center that I couldn't go. So, um, but I was able to send one of my staff um, basically kicked it off with the review of the new state reporting tool um, that's available to PSAPs um, to help them voice their their concerns with um, 
uh, issues uh, around the CPE or um, our uh, RNSPs, um, as well as reintroducing and going over the next phase of the pre-migration testing, what, what, what that entails, um, how it all works, uh, as well as onboarding the new management company uh what's what's going to be there again the resources how that's going to impact all of us uh we also introduced our new la county um rep so very very happy about that um i'm sure you'll be getting a lot of emails from everybody in the state uh everybody in the county switching gears in la county we've 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 not had a lot of really great turnout to the task force of late. So um, we've embarked in a, um, we have a new LA County coordinator. Um, as you know, Ella retired. Um, uh, uh, Leandro and myself have been talking, so we embarked upon a more concerted effort to actually onboard some new agencies and some new talent. Um, so it's not the, you know, the Greg and the Josh show. Um, uh, and get some more voices in there so that when Cal OES does come uh, down, uh, there's more value there versus them just giving us presentation, folks sitting in the chair going, yeah, that's nice. And then we all move on and I show up and I give you the same thing that they gave you. So um, we do have uh, one, two, three, four, five, uh, five agencies that we're reaching out to um, and another few uh that uh we're in talks with because in we do see value in, in the task forces but we need folks to show up so that we can actually give valuable feedback from the chair uh back back to cal oes and then of course the lrpc any questions for la county i think you bring up a good point josh in la county that task force specifically has always been lean and mean uh, we 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 set that one up most of them are 15 people or so so that we'd always have like a good round table but uh when ella and i put that one together we handpicked i think like nine people so we kept it small because you know um, those were the people um and, and i think early on we had good engagement but this task force has been going on now for four years five years almost so you know the the that's how you have membership changes. You have people retire. You have, uh, you know, you know, you just have fatigue, right? I mean, like, it, it it's a long, it's a long project. So, um, I will ask uh, as uh, the LRPC members here if if you have PSAPs in your respective areas that you would like to to bring on board to any of the regions for the task force. We're we're certainly open to new members at all times. It's not a an exclusive uh, club. Uh, we just want people who we don't even want technical people necessarily, just people who will give feedback, people who want to talk. Um, there's, you know, we, we don't want to show up to a meeting like Josh said and give our spiel and then have have no feedback. That's that's not the goal here. So uh, we just need good operations oriented folks who can kind of digest what we're what we're saying and, and and give us some good feedback. Is there you talk about four or five years now. Is there material for a new incoming task force member to know what this thing is so you don't spend task force meetings getting people up to speed and repeating yourself? Yeah, we never get anybody up to speed. You get dropped in. That's what I mean. It's like <laughs> it's uh, we have a charter. Uh, we wrote a charter that we do provide to new members. So I do have a charter that's available um, and I can, you know, hand that out to I mean to anybody. Um, it's uh, it's not a heavy read couple pages. Uh, we, we developed it at the outset of this. I think it's still mostly relevant. I think one of the things that we'd like to talk about, I think this is a good segue, um, is the, the charter as it's written. It was written forever ago. Um, so long ago, I think when when we brought it to the LRPC, I think Chris Heron and Chuck Berdan were still here. So I mean, it's been a while. Um, that charter was written specifically with a goal in mind for that task force. And that goal was to advise us on operational input from the um, from the um, next gen 911 rollout, right? So we would come in and we would say, okay, here's what we are doing. Here's what's happening as we build this network up. How is it going to affect you, the dispatcher? How can we make it better or make it workable for you? Um, and that topic, we wrung a lot of of uh, water out of that towel. I mean, we we really. Uh, we gosh years and years ryan and i went on the road and paul and um it really informed us 
I mean, more than you guys probably could even imagine in, in helping us shape this this rollout. Um, but we're not we're not rolled out, right? Obviously, we're we're getting there, but we're not there. But all of the decisions and all of the work and all of the input that the task force has brought us and all that feedback from the PSAPs has all been added and applied, or most of it has, not all of it, maybe. Um, but we're not making those decisions anymore. We're not reaching crossroads every day like we were back then. And so we, the state, are looking at this task force every quarter and saying, what can we bring that will stimulate conversation? Because the, those questions have all really been answered. Those pre, you know, those pre network build up questions are they're, they're pretty much all done. Um, so we have talked a lot. Ryan and I have talked a lot about should we rewrite the charter to focus on something new, and what should that be? What because we've asked the task forces several times. Josh, you've heard me say this like, probably three or four times at meetings. Do we want to keep these things going or do we wrap them up? You know, now that we have, you know, we kind of have achieved, I don't want to say we've achieved our goal, but for the scope of the charter, we've really achieved our goal. The task force was really good. And if we don't have a task anymore, that's fine. We can suspend them until, until the, you know, they're needed again, or do we adjust the charter to give them a new task? And I think that that's a good question for this group since, you know, they do filter out their report to you guys. I think um, just reassessing this, the scope of the project is definitely a direction that needs to be taken. Um, it's You don't want to box yourself in to say, OK, we've done this, so let's just cross this off the list and your your duties as assigned are, are satisfied. Mm -hmm. It should be an ongoing, just as the project is ongoing, and I think there should be um, a way to continue the process where we're at because there's going to be questions and all the questions need to be looked upon by the majority instead of just a small uh, group of individuals who you're talking talking to that are saying okay okay instead of saying well this is what i think yeah because there's there are a lot of individuals in this profession that have a lot of concerns. They have a lot of ideas, and those things need to be considered. Sure, a hundred percent. And that's been our biggest struggle over the last year was coming up with topics that we can engage in in a real conversation with and get real feedback, rather than here's what we're doing at the state. the 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 number one rule every quarter when we sit down to to create task force slides is no presentations. This is not a this is not a brief out. What is every topic we have needs to be a discussion point rather than a here's what the state's doing because then you're just traveling around every quarter to four different sites. It's not easy. I mean, scheduling these things, getting everybody together, pulling everybody together, um, and they're small, so you're only hitting a select amount. You're only hitting forty piece apps, and so that's not efficient for a for a brief out. So um, yeah, hundred percent agree, Brenda, and and it that's where we. Uh, that's where we have recently kind of hit a little bit of a wall of how, okay, what can we keep this thing focused on that we can have a, a real round table, you know, and really get those ideas. Yeah, I don't think it's, I think it's perfectly reasonable for us as an LRPC to every year say, what are we doing with this task force? What do we need them to do next? Like policy-based routing. Once we have something on paper, we do need that team of people to look yeah. at it and give us feedback and tell us if we've lost our minds or if we're totally missing something that's very important. Um, so yes, I think we need to pull that charter out, dust it off and figure out what are we doing over the next 12 months and keep that going until we've decided we've done everything and there isn't a new topic, which probably will never happen. Potentially, right? And that's that's we've tossed around so many ideas, you guys internally, just does this thing become a, a, a just a, a user's group? Right, just a, a tip of the spear for for you know all things new technology. That when we, as we adapt and roll it out, these are the people that give us direct feedback. We, I mean, we've we've really tried to uh, think about ways that we could keep this group going and 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 keep it useful. Because uh, what will happen is at the end of the day, is if it's not useful, people won't show up, and then you know then it's then what's the point? So. So do you have an ask of us today that your plan is? Yes, I do. <laughs> That's a lot of homework. 
Well, uh, so I, I think this one's easy. I think you guys, if if everyone's got um, uh, just just ideas, just jot jot down your ideas of 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 how we can make the task force viable into the future. The the hard part of this ask is just being mindful that it's a it's supposed to be a conversation and not a brief out. How do we have a topic that's broad enough? that we can always add something to it or keep throwing stuff at it, but not so narrowly focused that we run out of stuff to talk about after the first two, three meetings. That's the that's the challenge. But if you guys have ideas, we're we're all ears. Absolutely. One of the things uh, with the task force, uh, first of all, Josh, thanks for coming out and uh, doing that brief there. And uh, afterwards, if you don't mind, I'll catch up with you and see if I can't help with some of the LA uh, area PSAPs as well, too, for some recommendations. Um, but secondly, I, I what I hear, what I hear is I uh, listen to a lot of discussion is that um, we're missing some of the strategic planning that helps set these up in advance. Um, and so, uh, you know, it might be a good idea for this group uh, not only to look over the charter, but agendize at some of the meetings coming up like if we wanted to kick off what the plans are for uh you know calendar year uh 2025 then our at last meeting we set our strategic goals so that can be passed down to the the task force uh secondly i think one change we can make um to help with that is you know take the technology portion out of it in the title um, you know, these should be, you know, strategic task force, you know, for 911, because there's a lot of topics at those meetings that aren't always technology based. And some of the topics that we're dealing with at the, at the LRPC, even on this agenda, aren't necessarily technology based. And um, as someone who sits on the Southern uh, Region Task Force, there's a lot of great discussion that happens that isn't just technology and, and learning oh, yeah. from the PSAPs of, of the struggles that they're facing, the challenges they're facing. and it's a very rare opportunity in those meetings where we have good representation of different disciplines, small PSAPs, large PSAPs, and you know some some things are a big deal to others and not to others. So the more we can uh, leverage that group, I think it'll make our decision space uh, a little bit easier and we'll be more informed. That's the that's the the beauty and the and the frustrating part of the task forces is that um, I'll ask the same question to all four of them and I'll get four completely different answers. It's a, it's a good thing, uh, but it also is um, it just shows just how diverse the the population is of peace absent state, right? Uh, but yeah, no, I appreciate it, Jeff. So were you at the southern region on this last round? Unfortunately, I was not. <laughs> It okay. was uh, conflicting with the LCW conference I had to go to. Well, then I won't ask for your brief out, sir. <laughs> Excellent. Do we have anybody else who was present and would like to brief out online, perhaps? All right. Hearing nothing, we'll look forward to the charter and putting together our thoughts, sending them in. Anybody else? I've got Aaron and I've got you guys. Anyone else that's missing today? The LRPC. I think this is everybody, right? Okay. I'm sending it now. Thank you very much. All right, moving on to the next item, which is agenda items for future meetings. Does anybody have any agenda items to add to our plethora of items? We give Jody enough homework. There's no more. I know. Right, hearing nothing, quickly moving on from that item. Uh, public comment. Anybody have any public comment? Going once, going twice. All right, Mr. Chan, we are moving on to adjournment. Um, do I have, I don't need a motion to adjourn, do I, for this? All right. Thank you, everybody, for your attendance and your feedback today at 2.43 p.m. The LRPC is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all.